Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dice Tower. My name is Z Garcia. I'm Mike Delicio. Today we're taking a look at NAR. This is a card game for two to four players, about 30 to 45 minutes or so, in which you are comboing things together, mm. trying to develop a specific strategy to shoot you to 40 points before anybody else. So it's kind of a race game. Yeah, absolutely. In which you are targeting specific things. Do you want to focus on your reputation and therefore earn passive points? Do you want to try to make combos and then trigger those things you're accumulating? Do you want to build large columns of Vikings and by adding a single one, everything triggers once again? Lots of different things you can do. Mike is wrong about which ones are good. <laughs> Let's take a look at it. The objective of the game is to get to 40 points going around the track here and making it back to that spot. At the end of the round in which somebody gets to or passes 40, whoever has the most points is going to be the winner of the game. To set up the game, every player is going to have one of these boards here with a matching token, a circular token that goes on here, and one that goes over here. Uh, these boards have two sides, sort of an, a starting side they recommend, or this side over here. It has a few different symbols at the top. Across the bottom, it also tells you what you begin with. In this case, I, I'm going to be showing you just the space for one player. We have two different colored cards, and I begin with one of these recruits and one of these bracelets. I have a max of three, so I put the rest down here. I don't have these, all right? Uh, and then everybody has a hand of three cards. We've also created some lands up here, three from this deck, three from this one, and then from the shuffle deck, uh, a, uh, a lineup down here, tying to these spaces that correspond to the colors I'll explain in one second. On your turn, you do two steps. The very first step is the reputation step, where you're going to check if you are far up enough on the reputation track over here to make some victory points for your uh, your points here to go up. So for example, I'm going to be playing the, uh, the white piece there. Go ahead and put myself on top. If I have this piece up to this spot, I am going to, at the beginning of my turn, get two victory points. So I would just move up two immediately. If it is uh, all the way up to this one, then I get three and so on, all right? So at the beginning of a game, of course, I will not have any of those. That's step one, checking your reputation, moving up on the track if it, uh, if it matters, if you, if you qualify. Step number two is picking between two actions. You can either do a recruit action or you can do an explore action. To recruit, you are going to take a look at the cards in your hand. You are going to play one of these to the area in front of you. If it is a new color that you don't have, you'll simply create a new column. If it is a color you do have, you can add it to the bottom of that column, leaving the top available and visible. So I will do that. I'm going to play this card to here. I play a card. I'm going to activate all the symbols in that column. Uh, this symbol here gets me a bracelet. Uh, which obviously I'm not triggering right now, I'm just pointing it out. And then this one gets me a recruit. And again, I can have up to three of those. And then the one above it is a victory point. Uh, and so I would get a victory point. You might also see over here this symbol, which is going to be moving up on this reputation track. There is the musical instrument right there. So I did that. And then the final thing I do is, since I played a blue card, I go down here and I check on the blue spot the card that's there, and I add it to my hand. We replenish that spot, and it is the next player's turn. And again, that's option one. Option two would be exploring. In order to explore, I'm going to go over here to this area and acquire one of these lands, one of these cards. They have on this side the requirements that I must pay to take that land. And that would come from Vikings that I have in front of me. So let me go ahead and skip ahead a little bit. Let's say my next turn I play this card. I'm going to scoot this over just a touch. Play that. I get a victory point. I then go over here and look in the yellow spot and I take this card into my hand and we replenish it. My next turn I'm going to check my reputation first of course and then I'm going to take an explore turn instead of a recruit turn. I'm going to acquire this one. This one says I need three Vikings of different colors. Fine. 
So I'm going to discard one of these two blue and the purple and the yellow. That's three different and then I acquire this card. Over here in this corner is something I'm going to gain immediately. In this case I get one bracelet and I get another recruit and then I take this card and I put it right here. As you can see there and we will replenish that. Any further lands I take in the game are going to stack up like this, all right? Uh, and then that continues. I'll stack up, you know, the next one I take would maybe stack up like this, and so on. Now one final symbol that was here and I have not triggered yet, this one has a card shape with a plus sign. It simply means take a card from the deck, put it into play, add it to its corresponding stack, but do not activate the symbols on it or the rest of the stack. Just add it to your pile of cards. All right, there we go. Uh, and so that would be my other option. I can either recruit or I can go over here, discard some Vikings, take a land, trigger the special abilities immediately, might include victory points or what have you, and then add it with these symbols lined up in the corresponding spots. Now, these two tokens that I have not spoken about are going to let you do a couple of other things, all right? The bracelets over here, you can on your turn, before or after you take your main action, you can spend one, two, or three of these to activate your first, your first two, or your first three, or all of them, columns, respectively, okay? So right now, if I had this, and I spend a single one of these on my turn, I'm going to make one victory point. But if I spend two of them, I'm going to get one victory point, plus one recruit, plus two victory points, uh, and I would get all of that uh, if I can hold it, of course. So that is what the bracelets do. If you do all three, then you activate all three columns. The recruits do one of two things. You can spend them to eliminate the cost of one of these requirements. So for example, if on my turn I want to recruit this card, I have one blue here, I could spend one of these to account for the other blue card I need, and I can now recruit this land. I can claim this land and put it there like that. And then the other thing you can use these for is when I play a card, when I do a, a recruit turn, which are a little more um, frequent than the explore turns, and I play this and I take my, uh, my recruit and my victory point, and then I would have to go down here and take this card from the purple spot that matches the card I played. I can discard one of these to ignore that restriction and instead take anything I want to and add that to my hand and then replenishing that. So there we go. Like I said, we continue taking turns until somebody gets back to 40. We finish out the round and the most victory points, that's the winner of the game. There we go, that is the game. Uh, this is one that I saw online mm -hmm. several people comparing it to Splendor. And I just don't see it. Really, I had not seen that, and I agree with you. I don't see it. I think that's a very weak comparison. <laughs> yeah, a lot honestly. of people kept saying, like, oh, it's kind of like Splendor. Oh, it sort of seems and feels like Splendor. And, in fact, I was a little sort of trepidatious going into yeah. it because I thought, okay, well, I don't really love Splendor. Right. And I I think I understand what they're saying, this idea of getting better at something over right. time. But this has such a, a more interesting ebb and flow. In Splendor, your discounts, your your mm. your engine, for lack of a better right. term, sort of just builds and builds and builds, and eventually you win the game. Right. Or you lose. In this one, your engine is a little more cyclical than that. You might build, and again, you sort of... Put out a red card. That's not great. You put out a second red card. That's a little bit better. You're re-triggering the previous one. Mm -hmm. A third, a fourth. So your engine is really ramping up. But you need to actively destroy that That's stuff it. to get land. Right. That's the thing. And you, there, there's this dance between like four moving parts that I found very interesting. I agree. Yeah, just using that Splendor comparison as a as kind of a launching board. Splendor is basically a pure engine builder, right? right. That, that's really all it is, and you're making things cheaper for you as you go on. And like you said, the big difference here is that you are building up many little engines, if you want to use that terminology, and then, like you said, destroying them. One of the things that I think is interesting about this game is that, you know, in many games when points are essentially a resource, mm -hmm. right, like anything else, 
That's always going to be your priority in the in most right. games. I found pretty quickly that they're not necessarily here. Sure, points are going to get you what you need to win the game, mm -hmm. but you're usually going to get more points in other ways than just playing cards as they points. They give you points, right. yeah. Right, yeah, absolutely. So like you mentioned, the reputation track, that is one that if you're going to go down it, I think you need to make that decision mm -hmm. in the first round and make that a priority because yeah. that's passive points that you're going to get in every future round. Right. Um, sometimes late in the game, you may have to, you know, move up it as a consequence of having it in a, as, a, as a reboon on a card. But if you're going to go for that as a strategy, you need to make sure you lock into that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the lands, I think, are also very interesting because not only are they going to be obviously uh, point producing, I shouldn't say obviously, they are oftentimes point producing, um, but they also are going to give you some things that you can kind of trigger on your player board right. by sort spending of like one of the two resources. They kind of feel to me the the, the lands and you stacking them up yeah. is sort of a slower or like a longer cycle yes. version of you playing the cards. cards. Right. Right? And they don't destroy. They don't go away. You sort of, you know, you build up to them mm -hmm. and after you have four, then two bracelets triggers a bunch of stuff. Right. Just like a single card play might trigger that card and four others. Mm-hmm. And I like that. Again, yeah. the cadence in this game is very interesting. It is. There's something about the give and take, the cadence of the game, the what do I do when? What am I willing to let go from my tableau that's looking really good right now? Right. Uh, do I wait, get some of those Viking helmets, you know, yep. the recruits, I believe they're called, and spend them instead of my cards? Right. But then I'm... If I'm getting helmets, I'm not getting something else. Right. That's exactly you know? it. Um, and I find that just rhythm of the game really, really interesting. And in fact, my one issue with the game is sort of tied to that rhythm. And that is, very simply, I think in this game you see the end coming. And the game you is do. a little anticlimactic. I agree with that. Um, the last three, four rounds maybe. Right. You can see it coming, and it becomes a little anticlimactic. The game peaks before it's done. I do agree with you. You know, yeah. uh, that's my one issue with the game that I found less than thrilling. You and, know, and, and it's I, not a long process, right? No. It might be like, oh, these last five to eight minutes, I'm like, eh, I'm not going to win, or I am going to win, and everybody sort of knows it. Right. I think that that issue is exacerbated by the fact that it's a race game, right? Mm -hmm. Certain other games, you know, certainly if there are a set number of rounds, you kind of right. know, you're like, okay, I've got maybe three more turns, things along right. those lines. But in a race game, you want to feel that thrilling finish. Right. You don't necessarily have that here, like you said. Um, so it's a little bit more of an issue in this than it might be in other games, but it's still not yeah. a huge issue. And there's no hidden score. Right, exactly. Right, right. so there is yeah. no, you cross the finish line, and then we reveal the final right. you know, flourish, yeah. and look at that, I was able to pull ahead by one point. Right. There's no such thing. Right. Um, which makes sense for clarity, but sure. it does rob the game end of a little excitement. Right. Uh, as far as the everything else and the actions and the mechanisms, the gears within gears, yeah. I think they are obscured enough so that you can play quickly and not get bogged down, so that you can't really math it out too right. early till you get to, about, like I said, the last three rounds or so. Um, but they are, and so I like that. I like that it's sort of not obtuse, but sort of obscured from from view. But it's also so easy to take a turn in this it game. Really, I is. really do like that. Mm -hmm. And I like, again, the sort of cascading effects of doing something. Me playing this yellow card means I re-trigger these things, which means I move up on there, and I get this card in the yellow spot. And that's going to inform a later turn, so on and so on. That's one of the, That was a mechanism I was going to bring up. I'm sure I've played other games where a card that you play influences a card that you gain from a market of some type. Sure, sure. But I can't think of many, A, mm -hmm. and B, I really think that that is what sets this apart. Because, you know, it could have just been play a card, do some things. But it's not a, necessarily a linear decision. Yeah. Because it's, it, you know, it's a strategic decision. And so much so that um, you have those recruits that can let you break that rule. Right. And you are going to want to do that, especially yeah. later in the game. Early in the game, I'm not sure it matters as much. But, um, yeah. There's yeah. definitely icons or symbols right. or colors yes. that you want to spend that recruit to 
not take the one you would get, but something right. else. It's it's a it's an interesting choice. It a really lot of is. a lot of little choices, mm -hmm. little moments that lead to a fun. I would even say this is a sort of filler length game. Yep. You know, it's 30, 40 minutes, like I said, but but it's more satisfying that, that than that. It's sort right. of a hearty soup. This game, I really did enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into my final score. Um, this is a tricky one to score because, as like I said, there's that sort of anticlimactic feel. And then I also thought, this is my other, I suppose, uh, small negative, the reputation track on the board could have been clearer. Yes. They do this sort of... Bah, 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 yeah. bah, and that's, it seems unnecessary there's to do that. Plenty of space to there's not do that. There's plenty of space to not have to do that. And it also, unfortunately, gets a little crowded on there with the little wooden cubes if you're playing four players. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, I really do like it. I'm coming in at a strong eight for this mm -hmm. one. Really like it. Exciting, gorgeous-looking game with because of the nature of the game a bit of a letdown of a finish and and a, a, you know a small unfortunate graphic um choice that they made other than that this is a winner i really really enjoyed it great game to bring to the table yeah i, I agree so much that i am also coming in at an eight um it was very close to getting that excellence but like you said there were a couple of things that that made me just just slightly go yeah. there, the, but yeah. it's one I can easily recommend. It has one of my favorite thing in games, especially card games, which is feeling unique, doing some clever things mm -hmm. with not without a lot of extra rules. We mentioned the rules teach versus the experience you get is a great ratio. Yes, you mentioned briefly the the, the look of the game. It's gorgeous. Yes. It's for a card game as silly as it sounds. It's almost overproduced. Sure, um, but but it's still in a small box, and and I don't know the retail price, but I doubt it's anything that's mm -hmm. you know excessive. So. Beautiful looking game, a game that you'd be happy to have on the table. People are going to go, oh man, these are beautiful cards, and and uh, so good production, really solid mechanics, easy to teach. It's a winner. Yep, I agree. That is NAR, everybody. Check this one out. Do not go into it for the theme. Right, there it is, is quite abstract. Yes. But if you want something that is not too crunchy but mechanically satisfying. Mm. Like a hearty soup, I think I've said. Mm. Then this is a good one to check out. So there you go. That is NAR. Seal of approval from us. Thanks, everybody, for checking this out. My name is Z Garcia. I'm Mike Delicio. Go raid some long boats. Yeah. Or, or soup. Soup. <laughs> Ra raid raid some soup kitchens. No, mm. not, not no. someone's house. Have a good meal. R soup. <laughs>